The following program was paid for by the friends and partners of Neil Thomas Ministries. Amen. I'm just going to open in a word of prayer before I speak. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the privilege of being able to come into this place, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your spirit. We thank you for the worship this morning, for the communion and the offering, and just for the privilege, God, of being able to come in this country and still open the word of God freely. And we thank you for it, Lord. And we pray, God, that you will keep the doors open in this land for us to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we come this morning, I just pray as we go into your word, as we speak about you, Lord, your word is true and it's flawless and it never comes back to us empty. And I pray, Lord, this morning that we'll quieten our minds and open our hearts. Pray that you, we will receive from you, Lord, something new even. Every time we open this word, Lord, there is something new that you want to speak to us. And as I share this morning, Father, I just thank you for the opportunity of being able to stand here on this pulpit on this anointed place, God, and be able to share on your behalf. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Luke 13, verse 10 to 17. One of my very, very favourite stories of Jesus. Last time I preached, someone said to me, oh, you're a good preacher, but you're a preacher for women. You love to talk about women. Maybe that's true. Because I know one thing, if you have a powerful, committed and submitted women to Christ, you'll have a very powerful church. Amen? So I am going to talk about a woman again. (laughs) But there's something for all of us in this story. Luke put this in here for a reason, that we might learn something from this for ourselves about Jesus and his ministry and about the kingdom of God. And I have shared about this before, and I recently went to New Caledonia and shared it again. And it was very powerful. This is a very powerful, powerful word. Before I read that, Ezekiel 34, 16 says, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays, and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak. One thing I know about God is he's a seeker, and he seeks. He seeks the lame, he seeks the injured, and he seeks the lost. And that's part of God's kingdom. And God is a seeker of men. Amen? God sought out you and I through his Holy Spirit. Whether it was through a person or whether it was just through a voice that said, go to church, find me. He sought you and I out. And this is what Jesus did for this woman. He sought her out. And he hasn't changed. He's still seeking. He's still looking. He's still healing. He's still delivering. He's still binding up the brokenhearted. His ministry is still going forth through the Holy Spirit and through us who are his vessels. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this very uh, story I'm going to read is the gospel of Jesus Christ. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by spirit for 18 years. That's a very long time to be crippled. 18 years. Some of you aren't even 18 yet. This woman had had a spirit, it said, that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up. So that tells us there's a picture of a woman that was walking around like this probably most of the time bent over and couldn't straighten. The view of her her life and the view of the world was down, all she could see. She couldn't see the sun, she couldn't see the stars, she couldn't see the beauty of God's creation anymore. All she could see was the ground. It was a picture of her life. And Satan had bound her for 18 years. Verse 12. And I've underlined this heavily in my Bible because I'm telling you Jesus is a seeker. When Jesus saw her, that's mighty, mighty when Jesus saw her. Jesus sees you, something's going to happen. 
a decision will have to be made by you or I. But when Jesus seeks you out, something mighty is going to happen. Amen? Jesus saw her. And he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. He didn't whisper it. He didn't go to her. I think he said it quite powerfully, actually, because he was standing with a whole lot of religious men that were about to have another go at him. And he saw an opportunity too, Jesus. He saw an opportunity. An opportunity for good. An opportunity to glorify God. An opportunity to show who he was. And he called her forward. And he said, woman! Come here. He said, woman. He looked right at her. When he looked at her, he saw every part of her history, every part of her character. See, when we look at each other, we see each other. But when Jesus looks, he sees a whole picture. He saw everything and he knew this was the moment. 18 years of being bound was about to be broken. And that's why when Jesus seeks, he's mighty. And when he speaks, he speaks kingdom speech. Amen? Then that woman obviously came to him somehow, still crippled, having to go through the religious people, the men that were there that day in all their finery, 13. He put his hands on her and what happened? Immediately she straightened up. And what did she do? She praised God. Have you ever met that Jesus Christ? Have you met that man? Because you will praise him when you meet him. The very first face she saw was who? God. The greatest face you could ever look into. This, uh, this is why I love this story. How mighty is God? How compassionate and passionate. And Sonia said it this morning, purpose and order that God has in his kingdom. Amen? Hallelujah. But of course, when there's ever a great miracle, Satan rears himself up. It says in 14, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue ruler said to the people, and then he turned around and, and said to all the people watching this, there are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, not on the Sabbath. You know, wisdom speaks out, friends. Wisdom speaks out for those who cannot speak up for themselves. But the unwise ones didn't want heaven and hell to meet. Didn't want heaven to meet hell and unbind her. It said this woman was bound by Satan, Jesus went on to say. It, they're, they're foolish. They're ignorant to God's ways. Let us not be ignorant when God moves. I don't want to be ignorant and question his ways and question when he moves in someone's life because it's ignorant to do that. And it says that Jesus what? 15. And the Lord answered him, you hypocrites. You uneducated really in my ways, hypocrites. He was, he was strong when he spoke here, Jesus. He was very strong. Don't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it away? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. Amen? <laughs> but the people were delighted, of course they were, with all the wonderful things he was doing. 
Jesus came to make a public spectacle of shame and anything that binds a person that's from Satan. He made a public spectacle of, the, of Satan that day. Amen? And that's what he came to do. He's a seeker and he seeks to set people free. And he hasn't changed. He's still going around the world seeking to set the captives free. This is why we love him. I went to New Caledonia recently on behalf of Luke 8 here to sit with some women of Luke 8 in New Caledonia. And most of the time we just sat around, we talked, there was some teaching that Sister Shirley and I gave, we talked about this. And then we just went to each other's houses or went to people's houses and just ate and had dinner. And there was one lady there. And that's why I thought about this uh, particular story this week. And her name is Gladys. And I didn't know much about Gladys, but I knew she was kind of a funny one because wherever she was, there was always laughter. And there was something funny, you know, she was funny. And by the fourth night, we're sitting around someone's house eating and I said to one of the ladies, Gladys, she's an Evan lady, speaks fluent French, some Nevan, and when she mixes English, it's really funny because she just says funny things with English. Even like Aussie twang, mate, and all this, you know, they and all this she'll say to me and all these funny things. And um, one lady said to me, you know, she's got a very, very powerful testimony. And I said, oh, I'd like to hear that. So I said to her, Gladys, come and eat, sit with us. And so she came, sat, we were just eating, and through the course of the meal I said to her, Gladys, tell me, how did you meet Jesus? And she came from a Christian home. She said to me, oh, I came from a Christian home. She said, you mean how I met Jesus? Because I knew about him. Do you want to know how I met him? I said, yes. And don't laugh at this. She said, I met him when I stopped weeing myself. And I said, pardon? She said, I stopped weeing myself. And I kind of looked at Eva, who was interpreting for her, and she was nodding her head, sort of say, go on, ask, ask her more questions. I said, tell me what you mean by that, Gladys. She said, when I was a little girl, I had a lot of fears and insecurity. A lot of people have fears and insecurity as children, so that's not unusual, is it? Many of us have that. But she said, as she grew, the fears and insecurities started to bind her. And the rope was getting tighter. And the knot was getting stronger and tighter. And she said, what would happen is, when she would go to talk to someone, the fear and the anxiety of talking to someone made her involuntarily we herself. And of course, how embarrassing is that for a person? How awful is that? So as a child, you kind of, you know, parents can, oh, and people. But as you go up, people are like, what the? So that noose and that big rope started to really bind her and pull her into her room and make her stay in her room. And when anyone came, she stayed in her room, she said, because she would say to herself, she would have this dialogue with herself. I can't go out there. I won't be able to help what happens. I don't want anyone to see me. I can't talk to anybody. And so she's just started to be totally bound. And some things in life, you are so bound that no man and no person and no doctor can unbind you. And I said to her, so what happened? It's a long testimony. But she met Jesus, she said to me. And then I met Jesus. And I said, okay. She goes, and I stopped weeing. And the moment she said that, it was so powerful. Everyone at that table was weeping, including me. Because she said it like it came out of the Bible. 
like he was sitting next to her. I felt him there in the room. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Jenny, I have come to seek the lost, the strays, the brokenhearted, the bound, and I've come to set them free. She said when she went into the waters of baptism, she came up, she felt like she was light, like she was floating. And she said, and from that day, I've never weed myself. And here was this woman talking to everybody. The first one, hello, everyone, going off into her French, talking, everyone laughing. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, God, you are real. You are real, Jesus. You are so real. You are a seeker. And you come to set people free. It was such a, it just when she said it, if I could, if you could, if I could transport into you what I heard when she just said, and I stopped weeing, and she paused, and we all, there was just silence. And you could feel the Holy Spirit moving deeply. You could knew that Jesus was there. And you know, this is a story of a woman that was bound for 18 years. And in this story, there was another story. There was a story from heaven. And the story from heaven was that this woman should not be bound anymore. And the thing about this is that she was coming to the synagogue. And Jesus says, she is a daughter of Abraham. So it's like a person who continued to come to church. So she continued to come to the house of prayer that Jesus called it. The house of prayer. My father's house is a house of prayer, the synagogue. And maybe it would have, she would have thought many times, this is all in vain. I've prayed, I've cried, I've wept, I've done everything, I've been to every doctor I can go to. But she kept coming. She kept coming. Amen? She kept coming to the house of prayer. She kept coming to church. And I wrote something that Charles Spurgeon actually said. And he said, when a child is sick, they go to their father's home. They want to be with their father and their mother. And it's true. When we're unwell, if we have a good home, we want to be with our parents. We want to be in our own bed, don't you? In your own room or wherever you sleep and you want to be. You know what? When you're sick, you can come to your father's house where he will look after you. And that's, that, that's the key thing to this, this story is that she was in the synagogue that day as she had always been. But that, that day, that day, that very day that she came like she'd always come, Jesus was about to deliver her. You see, deliverance is coming. Deliverance is there because God is a seeker and he will deliver his word and his word is flawless and he is true and he is faithful. Amen? This is what this story tells me. This is what it says to me, Jenny, I am faithful and I am true. Keep coming to the house of prayer. Keep coming to church because Christ is here today. You know, Jesus is here through his Holy Spirit. He's here and he's here to heal. He's here to heal someone here this morning. He's here to to break someone's bonds this morning. Wherever he is, this is what he does. Wherever his spirit is, this is what he does. He preaches the good news and he binds up those and unbinds those who need to be unbound. And then he binds them up with his love and his healing. You know, when Jesus spoke, I said to you, he spoke kingdom speech. He said to her, woman, come to me. He didn't go to her. He said, you've got to come to me. She had to make a decision right there and then. Am I going to try and get my way to this man in front of all these other men and everyone looking at me? I mean, here was this woman walking in church as she'd always done. She wasn't really observed by anyone because in the day there was many, many people like this woman on the streets where Jesus was. Many, many. And it wasn't that people weren't compassionate towards that, but it was, they could seem indifferent, but not to Jesus. See, because when he sees, 
he really sees. And what did he see? He had compassion. He had compassion for her. He felt for her. He had passion for her because he knew what he could do. And he had purpose because he knew what he was about to do. And this is the difference with Jesus Christ. When we meet him like this, he changes our life forever. Amen? This is a powerful story, friends. And Luke put it in here for a reason. Jesus had an anticipation of joy because he was about to do God's work. He said, I've come to do my Father's work. I don't talk on my own and I don't do what I want to do. I do my Father's work. Do you know that anticipation of joy when you know someone is about to be set free? Have you ever felt that? Do you know that anticipation of joy when you know someone's about to come to the altar? And you talk to them and you say, if you just come, I know Jesus can deliver you. I know that he can. Have you ever felt that? I have. And you know when you bring them here and you see them delivered and you see them set free, the joy is beyond human joy, yes? It's a heavenly joy. And this is what Jesus had inside himself when he looked at her that day. He knew what he was about to do. And he knew he was about to glorify God in doing it. And it made him so joyous in his heart that he was about to set this woman free from Satan. Amen? This is what our God wants to do for you and me and for those in this community and for those in this world. If you get one thing out of this message, get this. God is a seeker and he wants to set people free. And this shows me that he is. But this lady had to make a decision just like we do in our life. And we have to make decisions all the time. Every day we get up, we have to make a decision about what we're going to do, how we're going to do, are we going to serve God, are we going to follow him, are we going to listen to him. We have to make a decision. It's our choice. When he spoke to her, he said, and it says, he said, when he saw her and he called her forward and he said, Woman, you are free from your infirmity, but she was still bow, she was still bent over. He spoke to the spirit and he set her free, but she was still physically bent over. And then he did something. What did he do? He put his hands on her. Have you ever had the hands of God on your life? Have you ever felt the merciful and gracious and kind and loving hands of God on your life? Had this woman been touched? How long had it been since she was touched? Could she be with a man? Could she have sex with a man? Could she lie next to a man? Who touched her? Who ever, ever touched her in 18 years? But he's, it says here that Jesus put his hands on her. And when he put his hands on her, the hands, not of rebuke, the hands of kindness and the hands of love and the hands of strength. He needed to give this woman strength in her body. Her body had been bound over for 18 years. She needed strength, yes? He put his hands on her and what happened? Immediately, she stood up. It gave her whole body strength. He put himself into her that day, I believe. He put his very self into her. And when Christ puts his very self into us, we can stand up tall. And we can be the very person that God designed and purposed us to be. And this is what happens when we have an encounter with Christ. And many of us sit here today and we think, yes, that, I've had that. That's good. Amen. But then we can go out and now be as Christ to other people. Why are we here? What is our purpose to be here today? What is your, my purpose to love and honour God? Yes, to come and worship him, yes. But what is our real purpose? It is to be like this. It is to really see in the spirit a person. Because I said to you, when Jesus saw her, he saw her. He saw everything about her, her past, her present and her future. Jesus is the beginning and end of everything. And he really saw her that day. And that day he made the decision that today, one word, 
One word, it took only one word, one line of a word to break the bounds of 18 long years. This is how powerful our God is when he speaks. One word from him and 18 years was undone and restored and refreshed. And I would say this woman went back to her family as Jesus did many times when he healed people. He he let them go back to their family. He restored their whole life to their family, to her village, wherever she was. And she became an evangelist for Jesus by telling her story. And this is what I told Gladys. I said, Gladys, your story. You have to share your story. Because she was a bit reluctant. I said, have no shame, Gladys. This is what Jesus has taken from you. Shame he has taken from you and given you boldness and confidence in your place. There's no more shame. Shame is a terrible thing, people. Shame keeps people bound. Shame is a, is a tool of Satan. And that's what this lady had. A timid, shameful spirit that said, I'm not worthy enough. I'm not right enough. My life is bound. I can't look up. I can't look into people's faces. Now, I know there's testimonies here similar to this. But when you stand in front of people and you voluntarily wet yourself and doctors can't help you, Because it isn't a physical thing, it's actually a spiritual thing that's manifested itself in your in your physical body. There's only one man I know that can untie that, and it's this man here. There's only one man that I know that can unbind and untie that even with just a word. It's Jesus Christ, yes? So why are we here? Why am I here? Why are you here? This is a man that lives inside you and me, yes? This is what you and I can do. You know, I remember my dad used to say to me, sometimes you don't even have to talk to a person. You just have to walk past and put your hand on their shoulder or put your hand, how are you? And you deliver them even there and then. You can deliver them from whatever ails them. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God has given you and I that same power and resurrection power? This is even before he resurrected. This is God. Do you believe that he has given us that? So the question that I have to have for myself, maybe this is just for me, is am I really seeing? Am I really looking? When I see someone, do I really see? Am I really seeing? Am I stopping and observing and taking time to see others? Because that's what Jesus did for this woman. And that's why I love this story. You know, the strong man had come. She was bound like an animal. Like a man comes into a place and binds up an animal. That animal doesn't have a choice. They might run and hide in the corner. This is what Satan did to her. At some stage, she was open to this. And he came and she might have been a timid girl like Gladys in the corner of her life, somewhere in her bedroom. And Satan just came in and he took her and he he bound her up like this, really strong. And there was nothing that she could do, nothing. Have you ever had that in your life? Have you been that in your life? Do you know people like that in your life? Because that's the work of Satan. That's exactly what he's come to do. But when Jesus enters into a room, everything else has to leave. When Jesus enters in, Everything else has to go. Let Jesus in today to whatever part of your life that you still might feel bound. Because he sees you and he hears you. And you know, you know, this is probably is a very woman thing. So the men can, I don't know, look at their phones for a second, but women want to be validated and they want to be heard. And this is what Jesus did for her. He saw her, he heard her, and he validated her. And he said, I know who you are, lady. And I know who you're supposed to be. And as a man, I see you, and I hear you, and I validate you today in front of all these religious men. Amen? Hey, ladies, amen? Amen? Amen. That's why I love Jesus. That's why those women went all the way to the cross with him. 
That's why they went all the way to the cross with him. All the way they went. Seeing him in that torture, they went all the way. That's why they went all the way. They met God. They met a man who saw who they really were. The bridegroom had come and he had made a spectacle of this lady's enemies. And you know, men, if you love your wife, you're like the bride, the bridegroom, and you make a spectacle of your wife's enemies, I tell you something, she will submit in love to you in such a way. Yes, ladies? All the romantic movies, come on, all of them. All the women that love those movies, that, you know, the men are like the supernatural, super duper heroes, and then he just loves her beyond any other woman. We love those movies, yeah? The chick flicks that all the guys. I remember a lady, she went to a movie with her husband, and she was watching this movie, and she was like, oh, just crying in it. You know, it's one of those real. And then she turned to him, she goes, oh. And she went to say his name, and he was like, oh. <laughs> he was asleep. And she told me, she was like, I was so upset, Jenny. I was like, oh. He was like, oh, yeah. Like, he was, did he try? And I said, well, he tried. She goes, I can't believe her snoring. I said, every other bloke was snoring in that film too. Because my mum and I were waiting to go into the next session, and we saw all the ladies come out, oh, and all the men. Or <laughs> their phones. <laughs> Dad and their mates, I did my job tonight, mate. Went with my wife or my girlfriend to the movie, you know. What, or looking for the scores of the football, actually, probably. was probably what's going on, yeah, Sonia? Yeah. This is what Jesus, he was the bride. He's our bridegroom. Do you know we are the bride? I know it's hard for men to understand this, but we're the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. But he has made a spectacle and he has, uh, as the Bible said, over all powers and principalities, he has put them to shame for us. This is why we come to him. This is why we love him. Because he's already put them all to shame. Yes? Amen. In your life, God has already put to shame anything that has tried to bind you. He has already called it out and said, it's already over. It's done. It's finished, as Matthew said today. It's already done in all of our lives. He just calls us forward. All he asks is us to come to him. And I'll tell you something, and we, most of us here know this, but it's good to refresh ourselves because it's good to, for me to refresh myself. When I come to Christ and the Spirit of Christ and he calls me and he touches me, I know it and I will never be the same again. And I know I will never be the same again. I know it. I know the voice of God in my life and I know the touch of him. Because no one else speaks like him and no one else touches like him. Because he's the king. He is the king of a kingdom. And when he speaks, all of the kingdom listens. And this is what happened that day. And that's why I wanted to share this story with you. And that's why he is the king of a kingdom. And when he speaks, he speaks kingdom speech. Have you heard kingdom speech out of God's mouth? Do you know when he speaks? Most of us here would say yes, yes. You're here today because you must have heard Jesus call you at some point in time. You're here today, you must have heard him. Why are you here today? Because oh, I better get down to church. Yes, there's a discipline in that. But why are we here today? I'm here because I want to hear this man, God, speak to me. He's got something to say to me that's just for me. And you never know. You never know. Never give up. My dad always used to say to me, giving up is never an option. Jenny, giving up is never, ever an option. Amen? It's never an option in the kingdom of God. We never give up. Because just as you're about to give up, that thing that God was going to do for you, it's about to happen. Don't give up. That takes faith. That takes faith, yes? Christ uh, ex um, extended his hand of faith to this woman this day. He extended faith to her. When he spoke to her, he gave her faith. He spoke faith. And today God's speaking faith into our lives. This could be for one person here, man or woman. 
God is speaking faith into your life today. He is speaking truth because he is a seeker and he has come to heal the brokenhearted. He has come to set the captives free. He has come to preach the good news. Yes, he has come to make a spectacle of Satan and all his powers and principalities and he has done that by the very power of his blood on the cross. That is what he has done. And he still cries out through his Holy Spirit around the world today. This is who I am. And you know, God is seeking you out today. God is seeking you out for himself again. And he tells you, come away with me. Solomon, the book says, there's a part where it says, come away with me, my love, come away. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, come with me, spend time with me, have a relationship with me. Out of this situation, this woman... I believe, formed a relationship with Jesus in some form or somehow she formed a relationship. Because I'm telling you, if a man did that for me, I'd want to form a relationship with him. If God did that, I'd want a relationship with him. Yes? And that's what God is calling out to us today. Someone here needs to be set free from something. Maybe watching or listening. And God is seeking you out through his Holy Spirit. He's calling you out and he's saying, come to me. And it's powerful when he speaks. Isn't like, would you like to come? Do you think you would like to come? No, it's come. It's commanding and demanding because there is purpose and there is order in his kingdom. And there's a reason why he's calling you for whatever that might be, to serve him, to honour him, to go to Bible college. Whatever it is, he's calling you and you know it. You know it. You hear him. And he's passing by today and he's calling you like he's called this woman. Why? To glorify himself, to glorify God's kingdom and to, so that we can look and say, yes, Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and is the Lord of Lords. And there will be a day when every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, this is the truth. This is the truth. And that's why I love the story of Gladys. Just sitting around, eating together, laughing, having our rice and whatever else was cooked, the chicken, Whatever else we had that night, and it wasn't about the food. At that table, Christ was there. His spirit was there. And in just one line when she said, and I stopped weeing, I heard God. And I heard the joyous voice of the Holy Spirit say, yes. Yes, I unbound this woman. Yes, and there was a high five with all the angels. Yeah. Amen? We high fived each other actually that night because I said yes and then we were high five, high fiving each other and then we were just laughing as women do. But it was a praise and that's what this woman did. Did she not when she was healed go and praise God? Openly she confessed who Jesus was in front of all these people. She praised God, it said. She praised God. You see, when we meet Jesus like that, all our inhibitions go because we can't help but praise him. We can't help but let him know what he's done for us. Are you like that? Can you not help but tell people what Christ has done for you? This is your form of praise to him, your form of, of worthy uh, worshipping him. You can't help but let people know what he has done for you because it sets you free. You can never be the same again when you meet Jesus Christ, never. And every day I think about Jesus and every day I wake up and I hear his spirit talk to me, I know I'll never be the same if I choose to listen to what he says. I will not be the same. I will be a different person. I will be as him. I will be as him. And this morning I'm asking you, Hear the voice of God and hearken to it. Just as this woman had done. Hear the voice of God and hearken to it. Yes? Amen?
Charles Spurgeon said, this is very old English, so, that 18 years a dungeon and it's about this lady. Build, build your dungeons, O fiend of hell, and lay the foundations deep. And place your courses of granite so fast together that none can stir the stone of your fabric. But then he who comes, the master builder, will destroy your works. And he does but speak, your Bastille will vanish. He who speaks and his strength gives confidence. These are the words of a great man of God, Charles Spurgeon. A man who's suffered with great depression but still preached every opportunity that he had to thousands so he knew what he was writing when he said that. You see, Satan can build a foundation in your life that is so strong that is made of granite, that is made of granite, that no one else can undo but this man, Jesus Christ. And that's why we love him and that's why we come to him. You know, when David went out, and I said this once and I preached, when David went out to meet Goliath, he searched for five stones. Why did he search for five stones? He only needed one stone to kill Goliath. Because Israel would face, in the generations after Goliath, Israel would face four of Goliath's sons in battle. And they would defeat his sons in every battle that they came out against. The five stones represented the generations of Goliath that day. When David went out and he killed Goliath, he killed off the generations of the enemy of Israel. And when he put that one stone in his sling and he went out against, in the name of the Lord, all David had to do was go out. It was God's um, job When that stone left that sling to kill Goliath, it was God's job to do that. All he had to do was just, and it says in that that scripture that he ran out hard. I love that. He ran out. He ran and he got speed up and he had that sling. Can you imagine the spectacle? An army on this side and an army on that side and a little boy on this side. Imagine the spectacle that day of the armies, all these burly, strong warriors watching this young boy go out with what? Stone, a little stone. What, Jesus? How dare you? How dare you untie this woman on the Sabbath? How dare you? David went out and he went out hard and he ran and he had those other four in his pocket and he ran. And when that stone left that sling, it said it hit Goliath like a bullet. No no human person has that strength. God took that stone when it left that sling and he killed the enemy of Israel. And all David had to do was go out. Yes? And he had in his pocket the generations of Goliath that Israel would overcome and defeat. And that day that Jesus healed that woman, he unbound her generations. God is generational and he deals in generations. He unbound her generations that day. That's mighty. That is so awesome to me. You know, when you met Jesus Christ and he unbound you, he has unbound your generations. You have a whole new generation. God has now aligned you with a whole new holy generation for himself. That's wonderful. That's good news. A little stone killed a mighty, mighty warrior. A little stone See how God works? That the Philistines had been Israel's enemy for many, many years. And they had taunted Israel for many, 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 many years. So whatever has taunted you for many, 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 many years can be broken in one word, in one small stone. 
can be broken even today. Whatever has bound you can be broken today. I believe that because I had it experienced in my own life. I know because I know Jesus has unbound things in my own secret, deep parts of my life. And I know I will say that. Glory to you, God, because if I hadn't met you, Jesus, there's no way I would stand up here and talk for you. Today, God is a seeker. God is a seeker, my friends, and he's seeking out for you. If you have been blessed by this message, please visit our website, neilthomasministries.com and click on the donate button.